Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Royce Hall. The commencement will begin in a few minutes, so please take your seats. I see most of you are seated. As a matter of public safety, the fire marshal requests that you stay in your seats during the entire ceremony. We also ask that you turn off all mobile devices during the entire ceremony. This commencement is being professionally photographed, but you are welcome to use your camera or recording device as long as you remain seated. And after the commencement, we ask that you remain in your seats until after the official party, the faculty and the graduates have recessed from the room. Thank you for your cooperation. Good morning. My name is David Cohen and I'm the Associate Dean of the Luskin School. I would like to ask our guests to please be seated so we can begin our ceremony.
And now, our student greeters, our student greeters will welcome you to our commencement ceremony in 14 different languages. You can certainly come up on the stage. Khosh Omadin Bajashne Forgot Hasilia Beast Beast to say, UCLA Luskin School of Public Affairs. Hi, my name is Abhilasha. I'll be doing this in Hindi. Uh, Namaskar, UCLA Luskin School of Public Affairs, Ka 2023 Pradam Sambrao Me Apka Swagathe. Hello, I'm Nazira. I'm from Kazakhstan. The language is Kazakh. Los Angeles, California, Universitet Nang Luskin Mimliket Kazmet Mikjev Nang. Клюктерді марапаттау кешіне қош келдіңіздер. Hello, my name is Mireya González and my language is Spanish. Buenos días y bienvenidos a la graduación de la clase del 2023 de la escuela de UCLA Luskin School of Public Affairs. I'm Patricia and this is Polish. Witamy na uroczystości wręczenia dyplomu w roku 2023 Szkoły Spraw Publicznych UCLA Laskie. Hi, my name is Naoki Hayashida. The language is Japanese. 2023 nian Laskin Kokyo Seisaku Daigaku in Sotsugyo Shiki e yokoso. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Sara. My language is Urdu. Assalamu alaikum, UCLA Luskin School of Public Affairs. Ki do hazar teis ki agaz ki takrib me khusham deen. Hello, my name is Riman and I will be doing the greeting in Bengali. Shubet cha chagotam. Onek donnobad, amra ekhon UCLA Luskin School of Public Affairs or tika graduate korbo. Onek donnobad jayas chen, balo thakin. Donnobad. Hi, I'm Hania, and this is Vietnamese. Xin được chào mừng lễ tốt nghiệp 2023 của Khoa học Cộng đồng trường UCLA Luskin. Thank you very much, student greeters. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our interim dean, Anastasia Luketu Sideris. Good morning, everybody. Morning. On behalf of the Laskin School of Public Affairs at UCLA, I'm pleased to welcome all of you, family and friends, faculty and staff, and most importantly, our graduates, to the 2023 commencement ceremonies. We are privileged to have an influential policy leader, Michael Tubbs, here with us as our commencement speaker. I will be telling you more about him in a few minutes. I would like to acknowledge the very important contributions of the Laskin School Board of Advisors, its chair, Wendy Gruel, and incoming chair, Jacqueline Wagoner, they have been standing next to me, supporting our school with passion, determination, and wisdom. We are deeply appreciative of their service. I also wish to acknowledge Mayor and Rini Lasking, whose generosity has made so much of what we do at the Lasking School possible. 
A few years ago, they were recognized with the UCLA medal, which is the highest honor that our university can confer. And yet, this is only a small token of appreciation for two people who have given our school so much with their remarkable generosity, friendship, and advice. Lastly, and very importantly, I want to acknowledge the families of our graduates, the parents, the grandparents, the siblings. It takes a village to raise and educate a child. Your support of our graduates in this educational journey has been indispensable, and I would like our graduates to give a round of applause to their families. Thank you. But today is, of course, first and foremost a celebration of you, our graduating students, and your accomplishment of completing a master's or doctoral degree, some even earning dual degrees with other schools at UCLA or outside UCLA, as you will find out. Some of you have also engaged in additional work and study to prepare yourself for global challenges. Would those students who completed the certificate in global public affairs please rise to be recognized? Others have taken classes to prepare for careers increasingly impacted by the rapidly changing technology and the immense flow of information and big data in our society. Would those who earned the certificate in data analytics please rise to be recognized? I also wish to recognize our first ever graduating cohort to earn the dual master's degree in global and comparative urban planning and governance in cooperation with the Urban School of Science Po in Paris. I know that a few of them have come all the way from Paris to participate in this commencement. Please stand up to be recognized. Today's celebration is partly about what you have already accomplished, a lot, but it is also about what you have to do. Don't worry, no more Laskin coursework. <laughs> At the Laskin School, you were motivated by the school's mission to advance humanity. You have studied how to make individuals, families, communities, organizations, and cities function better in ways that are not only more efficient, but also more just. In your time at UCLA, you have had the chance to work with distinguished faculty to directly address urgent social needs. Your efforts have been focused close to home, but also around the world. You have devoted hours of study relating to intractable social ills, such as racial injustice, poverty, inequality. You have looked at ways to counter displacement, to document how we can ensure environmental justice and adapt to climate change. You have pondered how technological innovation can improve mobility and accessibility, and you have sought to build coalitions to address social problems such as food scarcity and the lack of affordable housing that, of course, contributes to homelessness. At UCLA Luskin, we celebrate the faculty, students, and alumni who are making a difference. On topics and issues as diverse as homelessness, climate change, student achievement gaps, juvenile justice, mental health, HIV AIDS, civic engagement, immigration, and racial and class inequality, but also mobility justice, Lasking faculty and students engage the world as it is to diagnose and hopefully help address its many challenges. And we expect that you, are soon to be graduates, will be an integral and vital part of nothing less but improving the world. Individual accomplishments at Lasking are too many to mention here, 
But here are just a few of the collective milestones of this academic year. Our school reached the top 10 list of schools of public affairs. The other nine schools are considerably older than ours. We celebrated social welfare's diamond anniversary, 75 years of great work. And this department received a $3 million grant to help expand social welfare workforce. <laughs> Urban planning's proposal for a new master's degree in real estate development was approved with a very strong vote by the UCLA Legislative Assembly just two weeks ago. And public policy will be welcoming among its ranks a new chair and a very distinguished economist, Robert Fairlie from Santa Cruz. I'm very proud of the great diversity that characterizes our school. Our faculty are 50% women and 50% men, 50% faculty of color. Our student body is the most diverse in the University of California system. And about 40% of our students are the first in their families to pursue a college degree. I'm reminded every day of how remarkable and special it is to be part of the Ruskin School of Public Affairs and what a distinct privilege is to work with this diverse body of students. But beyond merely congratulating you, I want to thank you, maybe prematurely, for all that we expect you to do with all that you have learned. <laughs> As we gather here today, the next national election cycle is just getting underway. As a school of public affairs, we know that the selection of political leaders sets the agenda for years of policy decisions to follow. And for you, our graduating students, the decisions made over the next 18 months or so will likely have a particularly direct impact. You are taking your places in the workforce during a critical time, not just for America, but for the entire world. Who are we as people? What are our values? Will we make the right decisions to better all of society? We live in a nation with problems, a nation highly polarized, where basic human rights, reproductive rights, voting rights, privacy rights, even people's rights to choose their identity and live freely and with no fear are highly debated. Hate, hate against the other is on the rise, and homelessness and inequality are increasing. What is society going to do about these challenges? What are you, our graduates, going to do about them? As I look at you, and I have had a number of you in my classes, I take comfort. I know you have been well prepared. I know you will embrace the right of each and every American to determine their own fate. I know that you will work for a nation where basic human rights are cherished, where a person's zip code is not a determinant of the quality of services they receive or of their life expectancy. I trust that you will remain dedicated to a future in which geography, income, gender or race have little bearing on an individual's ability to access opportunity and have a fulfilling life. I can't wait to see all that you will accomplish. I hope your memories of UCLA and the Laskin School will be fond ones. Thank you for sharing this part of your journey with us. Congratulations. I would like to ask Chair Mark Peterson to come forward for the presentation of the Public Policy Student Award and introduction of the department's student speaker. Thank you. This year's recipient of the Public Policy MPP Student of the Year Award is Chenyere Nonye.
I wish I could tell you everything we talked about yesterday at an award ceremony, but I know we're on a schedule, so I'm going to defer on that. But an interesting twist as well is now is my time to introduce the student speaker for the address, the address, the student address for public policy. And guess who the student speaker is? <laughs> so I turn the podium to her. Thank you, Chair Peterson. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good to see you all. Um, I want to welcome you all for being here. Thank you so much. The title of this speech was inspired by a film, When You Finish Saving the World. It's a film that centers around a family, a mother passionate about social justice, a father committed to academia, and their teenage son trying to make his way in the world. They are so fixated on their ideals that they're distanced from each other and masked from the world before them. When I began crafting this speech and reaching for words that could reveal the message I wanted to share here, a message that I needed for myself, these are the words that came. Remember this while you're changing the world. In one way or another, many of us were drawn to this program by a vision. Spurred as much by hope as heartache, we answered the familiar call to be the change we wish to see in the world. We're all do-gooders, as Dr. Jasmine Hill lovingly calls us. Thus, we came to this program to equip ourselves not just to get a job, but to make a difference, whether in education, criminal justice reform, global politics, democracy, environmental justice, or otherwise. Many of us came here already thinking about what to do when we left. So though it's typical to use events like these to implore each other to go out and do good in the world, I don't need to tell you any of that. I don't need to encourage you to change the world because were it not for your vision to make this place better, you wouldn't be here right now. So what I do hope to impart to you is one reminder. Remember that while you are changing the world, take good care of yourself. It is said that you can't pour out from an empty cistern meaning you cannot pour out into others without pouring into yourself. Yet amid the rampant cycle of academia, amid a world that constantly feels like it's trying our faith in ourselves, each other, and our society, it's easy to gravitate to the work. As I said, many of us came here with a mission and a timetable. The things we seek to address are pressing. Justice cannot wait, we proclaim, because that community needs water now. That family that's about to lose their housing needs help now. This election needs our attention now. There's an inherent gravity to the causes with which we've committed ourselves. We can't help but give our all to the work because the work we do is about people's lives. So it can feel like there's not enough space or time for anything else. I can't tell you not to feel that way. I can't even tell myself not to feel that way. But what I will implore to you is that if you wait until you are finished saving the world, that day may never come. And to paraphrase something I once heard from Dr. David Turner III, if the only time you show up in community is to build up and not dwell within, you'll never fully appreciate what you're fighting for or be able to honor the work that's been done. So remember to take care of yourself and take time for community while you are changing the world. Hold space for your joy. Hold space for your connection. Hold space for your healing and teach others to do the same by your example. To quote Trisha Hersey, author of Rest is Resistance, you were not born to center your entire existence on work and labor. You were born to heal, to grow, to be of service to yourself and community, to practice, to experiment, to create, to have space, to dream and to connect. Treating each other and ourselves with care isn't a luxury, but an absolute necessity if we are going to thrive. Many of us come from backgrounds of hardship and we have an uncomfortable relationship with rest because when the world is constantly placed on our shoulders, we feel we can't afford to rest. And the reality is, no. The issues that we seek to address don't, uh, don't cease to exist in the moments in which we put them down. But in those moments when we accept that we must hold space for ourselves, we're reminded that none of this work was meant to be taken up alone. 
It is not your responsibility to change the world all on your own. It is a collective effort that sustains us. We support each other in our struggle and we support each other in our rest. So I say again, I don't need to tell any of you how to change the world or how to make a difference. You will impact the world in ways we don't even know we need yet. But I want to encourage you to remember to take good care of yourself as you discover how you will lend your part in changing this world. Don't wait until you're fin finished changing the world to embrace what exists before you. And it's the more you live, the more you experience, the more you connect, and the more you embrace that you will be reaffirmed and sustained in what you and what we all are fighting for. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you to my family. Thank you to my incredible mother. Congratulations, everyone. Thank you. And now I would like to ask Chair Laura Abrams to come forward for the presentation of the Social Welfare Student Award and introduction of that department's student speaker. Thank you. Good morning. Um, this year's recipient of the Outstanding MSW Student of the Year Award goes to Jay Kiros Martinez. Will they please come forward? <laughs> Thank you so much and congratulations, Jay. I would like to now introduce Jorna Islam, who will give the student address for social welfare. Good morning to my fellow graduating Luskin students and community. To my, te <laughs> to my teachers, administrators, my friends, family, my co-conspirators struggling for justice in the name of love. We have reached the end of grad school, but let's return to the beginning of our time together. Isn't it so odd but serendipitous that we entered this program just in time to spend most of it with each other in person, to think of everything that led us to seek an MSW, one small change, and we might have had to do our first year online. We did have those six weeks, though, where we were on Zoom. While I enjoyed having my camera off at 8 a.m., making an omelet, listening to you all doing check-ins, <laughs> I'm grateful for every moment spent with you, my fellow cohort. We are all here because we decided to dedicate ourselves to a life of helping those who need it the most. We saw how others were doing it, whether that was our family members and coworkers already in this line of work, or we were already doing it, or we watched social workers from afar and thought, hey, I can do this too. As social workers, we bear witness to people's pain daily. We do everything in our power to meet their needs with empathy, within the structures of our agencies, imperfect as they are. The poet Rumi said, the wound is the place where the light enters you, meaning the wound is the place where we enter. This is a deep commitment. Becoming a social worker has challenged me immensely to grow. More than memorizing DSM diagnoses or learning the history, social work is about embodying what is truly important to us through our actions. When our capacity becomes smaller, because we do so much for our clients, it becomes all the more necessary to set boundaries with our time and others. For me, I've had to say goodbye to people and put things on pause. I've lost several versions of myself, but in return, I come out of this program more resolved and confident about my mission in this world. At many points in these last two years, I have severely lamented my outside responsibilities, 
Some of us have had to work throughout the entire program to support our families. Not that you would know it though, given how tenacious and ambitious my classmates are about serving their communities. It was comforting to find solidarity in our mutual struggle, and I have so much respect for my peers who knew that their responsibilities are also an honor and not just a burden. I have learned from you to reframe my, I have to do this, to I get to do this. The opportunity to this education is an honor after all. Reflecting on our collective experience in this program, so much of our work has been about reimagining it. Our education let us explore the complexities and contradictions of social work and learn to improve the profession. We fiercely advocate for ourselves as we advocate for our clients, refusing to self-sacrifice or burn out. I know we can adapt to the shifts that are bound to occur because we went through our fellow graduate student workers pulling off the largest higher education strike in history. <laughs> and ignited by that fire, our cohort pivoted in one of our classes, changing the agenda to organize for paid internships. And not only can we organize for change, but we can organize for joy, as shown by our people organizing events like the Luskin Iftar. Yes! This is part of the reimagining. Over and over, I have seen us create spaces to meet our needs. Standing here at graduation, I still question if I'm good enough to do this. I think many of us are not sure that we're ready. But maybe this is a good sign one that signifies our commitment to growth. Questioning ourselves and remaining self-reflective is what will make us better social workers. What helps me through my feelings of incompetence is you, my colleagues and professors. You help me feel worthy. I know the Luskin community will be here for me, and I hope you all know I will be here for you too. Ultimately, social work is not just a challenging profession, but it is also the practice of being human. There is nothing more human than building strong relationships with each other. If we can remember our time together and the connections we made, let us also remember that we are more than capable of moving forward in our careers and beyond. Thank you. Thank you, Jorna. I would like to ask Chair Chris Tilley to come forward. To come forward for the presentation of the Urban Planning Student Award and the department student speaker. Good morning. The Urban Planning, Department of Urban Planning's top award is the Dean's Award for Overall Excellence. This year's award goes to Lillian Liang. Congratulations, Lillian. Keep up the good work. <laughs> and uh, I next want to introduce our student speaker, the one and only Antonia Zwogu. Here. I am genuinely honored to stand before you all today. These two years have been like no other. I moved to Los Angeles from little old Raleigh, North Carolina <laughs> with not much but a prayer. One of my favorite Bible verses are 
For God did not give me the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Yeah. I can say I truly enjoyed my time here because I followed my calling, as I hope you all have done as well. I studied black life and community wealth building initiatives. I worked on amplifying black worker voice in Southern California, helping organize youth advocates across the state for voter justice, did community engagement work in Skid Row for the mayor's office, and now in the Board of Supervisor Holly Mitchell's office, driving community development initiatives. I summarize my work as an inspiration to you all to follow, to allow your passion to guide you. I had the utmost privilege to see my classmates grow during these past years. I would catch myself learning from you all and enjoy listening to the passion in your voices. It's there. We all are destined to do great things, including our fellow public policy and social welfare collaborators. My wise colleague, Miguel Miguel, shared with me that we must all plan with our lived experience. He grew up in a mobile home park and was mocked for that reason. I've been homeless a couple of times, unbeknownst to the, those around me. But we all have our own stories to share. We should utilize our lived experience to do conscious, driven work. We need to include everyone at the decision-making table and no longer leave out the people who have been historically marginalized and disregarded. I charge, us, I charge us all to plan with our hearts. I repeat, I charge us all to plan with our hearts. I pl plan for the communities you wish to be a part of, plan for the people you love, and plan for the people you may never meet who will appreciate the fruits of your labor. The goal is to work ourselves out of a job, of course, while practicing self-care, because we need fulfilled people to fight for social justice. As we step into the next chapter of our lives, as for me, that means attending Howard University School of Law, as a future, as a future community economic development lawyer, and as for you, whether that's staying and working in Los Angeles, moving across the world, or just in need of a vacation right now. <laughs> we have more work to do and it's waiting for us. I look forward to working with you all and cheering you on. I also want to acknowledge my lovely family and friends for showering me in love and prayers throughout this challenging but worthwhile journey. And I want to thank the amazing and thoughtful Sleskin faculty and staff. Thank you for believing in us. Again, my name is Antony Zwogu. My middle name is Adoha, which means daughter of the people in the Igbo language in Nigeria. So I live as a community servant that follows my name. I serve the people who have the voice but are in need of a microphone, and I hope you do as well. To my dear class of 2023, I'll see you when I see you. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much to our graduate speakers and, and awardees. I would now like to ask Interim Dean Luketo Sideris to introduce our keynote speaker, Michael Tubbs. It is now my great honor to introduce our keynote speaker, Michael Tubbs. He made history in 2016 when he was elected as the first black mayor of Stockton, California at age 26. <laughs> Michael is a champion of social and economic reforms that have earned him a reputation as a rising star in progressive politics. As mayor, and even continuing today, he has planted the seeds of a nationwide campaign to end poverty. He is widely known for his work 
advocating for a guaranteed basic income to provide stability to American households. As mayor, he created a pilot program providing direct recurring cash payments to Stockton residents and founded the non-profit Mayors for a Guaranteed Income to support similar efforts around the country. This approach is serving as a model for other local governments. In fact, we recently had here at UCLA Lasking a talk by County Supervisor Holly Mitchell. She credited Michael as an inspiration for a pilot program that is now providing 1,000 Los Angelinos with 1,000 a month, no strings attached. <laughs> Michael's 2021 autobiography, The Deeper the Roots, a memoir of hope and home, discusses how hardship in his early years shaped his vision for leadership and for policies that are responsive to those who are struggling. He writes about his father's incarceration, the strong women who raised him, his scholarship to attend Stanford University, the opportunity to intern in the Obama White House, and his calling to return to his hometown to improve the quality of life of residents. Indeed, Michael has had a career in public service and public policy even before running for mayor. He served as a high school educator and as a city council member. He was later named a fellow at the Harvard Institute of Politics and the Massachusetts Institute of Technology Media Lab. He has also been named the Fortune Magazine's 40 Under 40, Forbes 30 Under 30 All-Star Alumni, as well as the nation's progressive honor roll. Here, the 2019 New Frontier Award from the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library and the 2021 Civic Leadership Award from the King Center. After leaving the Stockton's mayor's office a couple of years ago, Michael Tubbs joined the administration of Governor Gavin Newsom as Special Advisor for Economic Mobility and Opportunity. Last year, he founded End Poverty in California, a nonprofit devoted to breaking the cycle of income inequality. Michael? Are we done? <laughs> almost, almost. You have so many things to talk about, so. The UCLA Laskin School of Public Affairs prides itself on educating future leaders who will make a difference in society, and you heard it in the speeches today. We welcome you here as someone who shares and reflects our ideals. In you, our graduates will find inspiration as they continue their personal quest to bring positive change in our society. So, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Michael Tubbs. Um, that bio is longer than this speech. I don't know who, who gave you that. Or, uh, but, but in all seriousness, um, this morning I was mistaken a couple times as the student speaker. And, and at first I was excited because I thought that meant I still had it. Um, but, but after hearing the student speaker speak and, and taking notes about the importance of rest and leading with your heart, and I think the second speaker talked, called you guys a community of conspirators for justice inspired by love or something poetic like that. It's such an, it, it, it's, um, it is such an honor to be even on the stage with you all. And to be honest, class of 2023, you all don't need a commencement speaker. You all know what you are doing, but, but since I'm here, we're gonna spend a little time together if that's, if that's okay. Um, and, and, and I wanna start by saying just how incredibly proud I am of each and every one of you. Um, just seeing your families and the joy they had when you walked in seeing your mutual love and support for each other, seeing how your professors welled up with pride as you walked down the aisle, I know that there is not only greatness, but special, divinely created and important people in the audience that we are here to commemorate today. And as your dean said earlier, 
We're here today not just because of what you've done, but for who you will become. This is a pre-party, if you will, a prophetic party, if you will, because we know that there's a lot of great things um, in store. And it was only 11 years ago, I sat where you sat. I was the first one in my family to graduate from college. I with my, oh. Um, with, with, with my master's and, and bachelor's, and I remember sitting in the audience with no idea what was going to happen next. I knew I had a lot of passion. I knew I wasn't about to be broke no more because I had this college degree. <laughs> I ended up not being true for a little bit, but I, no, one told, no, no one told me that either. Uh, but I also remember being filled with a sense of pride, particularly on the day of my graduation, my father was still incarcerated. Particularly on the day of my graduation, my mother was only 36 because she had me at, at, at 16 years old. And so I'm like, wow, I made it. But no one told me what the college degree didn't mean. So I want to start there with you all. Your, your master's, your MPP, your PhD, your MVP, all the alphabets <laughs> um, behind your names. That doesn't mean you're better than people. It, it doesn't mean you're better than the people you want to serve. And, 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 and dare I say, it doesn't even mean you're smarter than the people who raised you, or, or, um, or smarter than the people you, you want to serve. But what it does mean is that you're better equipped to serve. It does mean you're better able to self-actualize. What it does mean you're better positioned to use your privilege and your access to, to, to do some good, because you all are graduating in a very, very interesting time in, in our country's history. Uh, I would argue you're graduating at, at a time where we're having the same debates we've been having since 1776 or even 1492, because graduates, you're, you're graduating at a time in this country where more books are banned than weapons of war. You, you're, You're graduating at a time where even in California, cities and counties like the one I'm from are voting against hanging the pride flag during Pride Month. You're graduating at a time, as Dean mentioned, where in some places throughout this country, women aren't given the ability to make health care decisions for themselves. You're graduating at a time where we have more income inequality than at any given time since the Gilded Age, right, right before the Great Depression. You, you are graduating at a time where we're still having a debate about whether black lives like mine matter. You are graduating at, at a time where, where trans folks are told that they're invisible and, and, and don't exist. You're, in, in California, you're, you're graduating at a time when the Golden State is the fourth most unequal state in, in this country, joined by some of the states we like to thumb our, our, put our nose downs to. You're, you're, you're graduating at, at a time where one in three households in California, here, don't have enough money to meet their basic needs, despite 97% of those households having someone work. I'm gonna say that again, because some people, not y'all, y'all smarter, but some people um, think that people don't have money because they don't work. But in California today, one in three families can't afford basic needs despite 97% of those families having at least one person in that household working. You, 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 you are graduating at a time, uh, again, as your dean said, where, where we need leaders who, who are courageous and, and, and bold and understand that the problem isn't with people. But the problem is with policy. And that's why you have those alphabets by your name, to help us figure out what are the policies we need to make this different. Because this is not the world we deserve to live in. This is not the world I want to live in. I think we all share the same value that everyone on this earth, everyone in our communities, and everyone in our society doesn't need a ceiling, but at least needs a floor, that no one should have nothing. And 
uh, I think one of the speakers talked about do-gooders. And, and, and I imagine you all took those five, you guys still take five-hour energies? When I was in school, that, that's what we, that, it's probably not healthy, right? You can start healthy. Well, back in the old and healthy days, a decade ago, that got me through school. And, and, and I'm sure you all, whatever you guys did to stay up, um, while working and studying and doing problem sets and internships and, and, and field work, I'm sure it was motivated by this impulse to be a good Samaritan. And, and, and my girl from Raleigh was preaching, so I'm going to use the Bible for a little bit. You, 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 you guys remember the good Samaritan story, right? It's a story. My grandma used to tell me the story all the time. She said there was one time a man was walking down the road. He was going somewhere. And he ended up being beat up, left on the side of the road to die. And, and, and then she said, um, a priest went by and saw the man on the side of the road and said that, hmm, maybe God ordained for this man to be on the side of the road. Maybe this was, was supposed to happen, and there's nothing I can do to change it. I'll just do some thoughts and prayers for him, and hopefully he gets, he gets okay. And, and, and then she said, um, a politician saw the man on, on, on the side of the road and said, hmm, I wonder what choices this man made to be left on the side of the road. And like, hmm, if this man hadn't traveled on the side of the road, maybe he wouldn't have been left on the side of the road. Or hmm, if this man he pulled himself up by his boots and his bootstraps on the side of the road, then, then maybe all, all will be well. And then she said a good Samaritan came by. And I don't know if it was a social work student or a... Um, <laughs> urban planning student, because urban planning, y'all got energy, y'all stand up for everyone. Anyway. It's, it's probably one of y'all, uh, an urban planning student, or, or my social workers, of course. Did I say social workers? Okay. Who, who did I leave out? I know there's like seven schools. Oh, oh yeah, public policy, of, of course. Um, it's, it's like eight schools here, I'm doing my best, no notes, pray for me. Um, um, but anyway, one of y'all saw the man, on, on, on the side of the road and, and sort of got off the high horse, got down, bandaged the man, made sure he was okay, took him to a, a nice place to, to rest and get well. And it was, similarly, it was that impulse that brought me to run for city council in Stockton after we had declared bankruptcy that brought me to mayor. But I want to submit to you as you go out to your careers that the Good Samaritan impulse is necessary but, but not sufficient. That, that, that being a good Samaritan or a do-gooder is not going to fix the problems I, I, I talked about. And, and I came to that realization as an intern, first as an intern um, in, in, in the White House. While I was there, my cousin was a victim of a homicide. And it was that juxtaposition between being caught successful and you're doing so well and feeling very powerless and, and angry and, and nihilistic. Because um, it's one thing to be giving coffee to the president's advisors and feeling good about yourself, but another thing to think about like, wow, my own family is dying home literally, and what's the connection between what I'm doing here and what's actually happening on the ground? So, so it was in that um, pain, and I think uh, our sister quoted uh, Rumi, that I found sort of this idea of, of running for office. So kind of the first nugget uh, I want to leave is that oftentimes in our pain is where we find our purpose. And that's not to glamorize pain or, 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 or to say that we, we need pain, but if you experience pain, don't, don't waste it. That oftentimes it gives you a clear glimpse as to what you're passionate about or what you're best equipped to help fix so others don't feel that. So it's really that pain that drove me um, to go to Stockton and, and run for city council. And, and then, but, but you know, sometimes you find your purpose and you think everything's gonna be easy and perfect. So the next year, my senior year, while graduating, I applied for a fellowship, I was told I was gonna get the fellowship, Plot twist, didn't get the fellowship. Um, and I remember feeling really, really down. Feeling like my plan didn't work. That the goal I had cannot be achieved because I'm not gonna go to Oxford for three years and study some more. Um, but, but I realized in that moment also that rejection is a powerful tool for redirection or recalibration, right? Like, like, like sometimes rejections or ways to get you to focus and figure out what it is that, 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 that you want to do. So with the pain to purpose and the rejection as redirection, I was armed with my good Samaritan energy and, and ran for city council in, in Stockton. I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> I had never even worked on a campaign before. 
but I just knew we had to fix what was happening. And I think our, our sister said this in her speech as well, that off, like, no one knows what they're doing. Let's be very clear. No, y'all, y'all think I'm lying? All right. I, I, this, is how, this is how we know it's true. All the things I listed earlier were created by people with degrees and, and titles. And like we literally live in a society that's the byproduct of someone else's imagination. But their imagination is no more informed than yours. Their imagination is no more valid than yours. And clearly, in many respects, their imagination isn't working. So I hope as you seek to graduate, it's not to not, but wait, 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 listen to this though. Uh, it's not to be reckless. Don't just try everything, right? Got to be informed by something, but also have some courage in knowing that a lot of people have tried and a lot of people have been called right, and yet we still have to deal with so much wrong. There is nothing inherently about those that created this world that makes them different or superior to you. You are at least just as good. I hope that courage liberates you um, to do, to, to do this, what it is you're supposed to do. But that was off script. So I was talking about, um, I was talking about city council. So, so I'm on city council. And, and I realized that we were doing good work, but the problems weren't changing. Like we had issues with literacy. So I was like, all right, well, let's start a summer book program. I'll be in the library every week reading with these kids. We'll do another program at all the housing pro pro projects. And it was great for the 50 kids in the program, but the needle didn't move. And I found myself getting frustrated. And then when we talked about like violence and, 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 and crime, and we talked about like hotspot policing and, and all these things, I was like, okay, it feels like we see more officers on the street, but the crime isn't moving. And, and that was frustrating. And, and that was a little bit um, discouraging. And time after time, it felt like we would have, and it was good work though, right? We felt good doing it. People were hungry, we would feed them. People needed backpacks, we do backpack drives. People needed books, we do book drives. It felt good, but the numbers were, weren't moving. And, and then when, when I became mayor, I was reminded of the Good Samaritan story, and I realized I had missed actually the point. And the point is this, if you go to where the story takes place, the Jericho Road, that road is literally structured for violence. Now, what does that mean? The road is narrow with bushes and trees and stuff, so it's conducive for ambushing, meaning that a person left on the side of the road wasn't an aberration, wasn't a surprise. It was supposed to happen by design because the road was constructed or structured for violence, which means what the Good Samaritan did wasn't bad, Someone has to get the person off the side of the road, but that's part one. Part two is if the underlying conditions of the road don't change, guess what happened the next day, or the next week, or the next year? Someone else was left on the side of the road. And imagine if you're the Good Samaritan. Every day, you're waking up, and every day you have to get someone off the side of the road. What happens after five years of that, 10 years of that? 20 years of that, you get angry, you, you, you get nihilistic, you, you, you become disillusioned. And, and, and that's why I want to submit to you all today that, that we don't need any more good Samaritans. What we need are construction workers, folks who are going to restructure and change the road. Um, John, John, Dr. Paul Farmer, excuse me, and um, a peace theorist named Jonathan Goulting, they speak about this and they talk about it as structural violence. And structural violence is defined as the avoidable impairment of basic human needs or the ways in which our society is organized that creates the outcomes we complain about. You know when your parents, hi parents, you know your parents when they're on Facebook and on next door complaining about um, everything, about, about the tents down the street and, and a kid with a hoodie was walking at night, I've never seen him before. And, and a porch pirate stole the Amazon, my fifth Amazon package this, 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 this week. Um, that's all complaining about symptoms, but, but I, I really believe that you all have your degrees and, and your energy and, and your passion to really get us thinking structurally, to get us thinking about how do we work ourselves out of a job, to get us thinking about maybe it isn't that some people are better than others. 
which is how our country has been organized historically. I mean, maybe it's not about that some people are more valuable than others. Maybe it's about the systems we create, create the outcomes we complain about. Maybe it's that the fact we don't build affordable housing means that people can't afford housing. <laughs> right? Like, like maybe. <laughs> maybe it's about that if people are working, but work doesn't pay enough to pay bills, then people can't pay bills. <laughs> like, no, like, think about it. Like, maybe it's that if the minimum wage is enough to pay for the cost of childcare, much less the cost of housing, that maybe people won't be able to afford childcare and housing. Maybe all these problems we complain about are complex, for sure, but maybe the solutions are ones that aren't about individuals working harder and aren't about individuals picking themselves up by their bootstraps and, 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 and aren't about um, individuals doing good individual things. Because I know a lot of good people who have been evicted and are homeless. I know a lot of smart people who work and, and don't make a lot of money. I know a lot of brilliant people who, who use drugs, but I know a lot of a poor people who use drugs, but I know even more rich people who, who use drugs as well. So again, maybe the problem isn't with the person on the side of the road, and maybe we could be upset with the robbers who leave people on the side of the road, but maybe the real work we have to do is figure out how we re re restructure the road. And, and as I prepare to close, all that sounds good, but I also want to make sure I'm being honest with you all. When you think structurally or differently, there's a consequence to that because the status quo has a lot of friends, even from people who complain about it. The status quo has a lot of supporters, even from people who aren't benefiting from it. The status quo is the status quo because a lot of people have made some sort of passive agreement that this is an okay arrangement. So when you speak out, when you speak structurally, when you move from charity to justice, from, from, from programs to policy, expect some backlash. Expect some confrontation. Expect some people not to like you. Expect some people to, to hate you. And, and don't go in naive. Don't, don't go in thinking like, oh, this is a problem, people want a solution. No, go in thinking it's a problem. And, and, and part of the problem is that people like it, so if I go to try to solve it, it's going to come at some, 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 some risk to me. And, and I say that because on days like this, like mountaintop days, no one talks about the valleys. But, but it's really the valleys that prepare you for the mountaintop. And, and I share that because three years ago, I lost re-election. I lost re-election despite dropping homicides because people said crime was a problem despite balancing our budget and leaving with a surplus, because people said the, the budget was a problem. And, and, and I submit to you probably the most important question you can ask yourself as you go through your careers and do what you have to do is not what are you willing to win for, but what are you willing to lose for? What are you willing to be ridiculed for? What are you willing to be talked about for? What are you willing to have to switch jobs for? Like, what are you willing to lose for? Because I truly believe in the answer to that question, you, you, you find purpose. And, and, and the other thing about purpose, which is interesting, and I didn't know this when I was sitting in your seats, that purpose isn't tied to position. Like, when I first lost re-election for mayor, I was like, oh my gosh, all this work around anti-poverty and guaranteed income, it's over. Because I'm no longer the mayor. And then I realized just three years later that your position is a means to an end. It isn't an end in and of itself. Your, your job, your title, your accolades, that's a means to an end. And that could be fluid, but your purpose remains, re, re, remains the, the same. And as I draw to a close, to, today is Tupac's birthday. Uh, And, and, and Tupac has this amazing poem about uh, the rose that grew from concrete. And it goes, did you hear about the rose that grew from the crack in the concrete? Proving nature's laws wrong, it learned to walk without having feet. Funny it seems by keeping its dreams, it learned to breathe fresh air. Long live the rose that grew from the crack in the concrete when no one else ever cared. And again, for some people, it's like, that's amazing. This rose grew from concrete. But for those of y'all with these alphabets after your name, it has to be thinking about like, okay, 
Why should a rose have to grow from concrete? Where do roses grow from? Why are we talking about this one rose that grew from concrete and not the thousands and millions of roses that didn't grow because roses aren't supposed to grow from concrete? And, and again, the, the work before us is really about demolishing this myth of exceptionalism, demolishing this lie of meritocracy, demolishing all the tropes and myths and untruths that help determine why our, our world is the way we are. Like, it, it's not enough to say, wow, I'm a first generation college graduate, or wow, I'm the first one in my family to get a master's degree, or wow, I'm the first one in my family to get a PhD. That, I mean, that's, that's nice. But, but, the, but the real question is, do you really believe you're the only one in your family that's qualified to get a degree? Like, like, what are the impediments in place that, 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 that made you the first. And I said I was going to close, I got two more points, because, yeah. Um, second to last point. Because um, a lot of, oftentimes, particularly, I'm so inspired, no shade to the men, but to see that all the award winners and all the speakers were women, amazing. Um, um, and many of you will, will spend time being the first, or the only, or the youngest, or et cetera, et cetera. And let's be very clear, there is no joy or satisfaction in being the first, or the only. And this is as someone who is the youngest, first, even now in almost every room I'm in. There's, and I used to take pride in that, but there's no joy in that, it's just a reminder of the work you have to do. And also, as VP Harris says, be the first, but make sure you're not the last. And when you crack a glass ceiling, glass falls down. It's going to hurt. It's not going to be all roses and, and, and accolades. It's going to be microaggressions and all the isms. That's why you're the first or the only. So never, ex never accept it, but please expect it and walk in knowing how to navigate. Now, as I really closed, um, Around the same time I graduated, I was able to go on the Freedom Rides with some of the original Freedom Riders. And one, his name was Bob Singleton. He's actually a UCLA grad. He, um, he, he, he told me that, well, we're on the bus and we're going through Anniston, Alabama. And, oh, go ahead. Oh. I'm glad you said something. I was about to say something shady. So I'm glad you, you, you let me know. No, I'm joking. Congrats to you. Um, and so we're going to the great state of Alabama, and uh, and he 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 was like looking off in the distance. And I was like, oh, he's gonna say something crazy to me. So he looked, and I thought he was gonna pull up my pants. Cause I was saying, boy, pull up your pants. But he so he's looking at me. I'm like, okay. And he says, Michael. I'm like, yes, sir. <laughs> and he says, I was arrested on August 4th, 1961. Why is that day important? And I said. You know, sometimes people just want compliments, you know, especially like the elders who want to make sure you recognize all the work they did because they did a lot of work to get us where we are. And I said, sir, if it wasn't for you and your sacrifice and your leadership and your bravery, we would not have this bus or these rights. And he just rolled his eyes. Um, and he said, on that day, Barack Obama was born. Then he said he had no idea the choice he made as a newly UCLA graduate to get on a bus, to change a system, even though he didn't know if it would work, would pave the way so a child born on that day, 50 years later, would have the chance to be president. And then he looked at me and he said, what are you prepared to do today so that 50 years from now, we're not having the same conversations about the same problems? And, and, and graduates, that's the, the, the final charge uh, I, I, want, I want to leave you with. Uh, again, he said, he was a UCLA, it's a lot of pressure, because he was like, I, I do this everywhere, but you guys are actually UCLA students, so it's even deeper. Um, he, he was a UCLA Bruin graduate, freshly graduated. And, and he made a decision to try to change something that people thought would never change, because it always been that way, not knowing what he was going to do would work. And when the stakes were a lot higher for him, it wasn't like getting fired, it's like getting beaten, going to jail, dying, et cetera. And, and, and he said he made that choice 
was arrested, and on that day, Barack Obama was born. And then he looked at me, like I'm looking at you all, and he said, what are you prepared to do today so that 50 years from now, the child welfare system is different? What are you prepared to do today so that 50 years from now, we're not talking about redlining, when we're not talking about environmental racism, we're not talking about gentrification, we're talking about planning for community health and wealth for all. What, what are you prepared to do today so that 50 years from now, we're not talking about failed policies and going back to failed policies like the war on, war on drugs or three strikes or, or over incarceration or, or, or all the things we know that don't work. Like, like what are we prepared to do today so that 50 years from now, we live in a state live in a country, and live in a society that's as, that is worthy of your gifts, of your talent, of your time, and of your treasure. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael Tubbs. Uh, not only an inspiring speech, but an actionable speech for all of us, all of us. Thank you. We will now present our doctoral candidates. Last night, the university conferred doctoral candidates in a hooding ceremony. We will recognize them here as part of our school ceremony. First, Chair Laura Abrams will present the social welfare doctoral candidates. The big day is here. It is my pleasure to call to the stage the PhD faculty advisors and their doctoral candidates in social welfare. As the candidates walk up, I'd like to ask Dr. Lei Chen to please join me. And there she is. It gives me uh, just a tremendous joy and an honor to uh, recognize Lei Chen and uh, her PhD for dissertation title, Disability Status, Financial Strain, and Health Well-Being Among Older Adults and Persons with Disability. This dissertation has already influenced how this state and the governor's master plan on aging is focusing additional policies to benefit older adults and persons with disability. And it's just a great pleasure to note that she'll be moving to uh, the UC San Francisco for a postdoctoral fellowship at the Philip Lee Institute for Health Policy, as well as continuing to work with the UCLA Center for health policy research as they move forward to develop new health policies for a more diverse California. Congratulations, Dr. Lei Chen. Here she is. Thank you. Well done. Hello, uh, my name is Dr. Laura Ray Lake, and I'd like to welcome Dr. Kristen Brock Petrosius to the stage. Uh, on behalf of myself and Dr. Marty Gillens, I'm pleased to introduce you to Dr. Kristen Brock Petrosius. Her dissertation title is Changing Dominant Carceral Attitudes, a Community Organizing Field Experiment. And I'm very pleased to announce that Kristen will be moving on to be an assistant professor in the School of Social Work at Stony Brook University. Congratulations, Kristen. Hello, 
everyone. My name is Dr. Amy Ritterbush, and I am thrilled. I am thrilled to call to the stage Dr. Dominic Michael Montgomery. So, introducing again Dr. Dominic Michael Montgomery, everyone. Her dissertation title is We Are the Dream and the Hope We Rise. Wellness as rootedness reconceptualized with older youth impacted by the child welfare system. Dr. Michael Montgomery is now an assistant professor in the School of Social Work at the University of Nevada, Reno. Congratulations. And I am also so thrilled to call to the stage Dr. Laura Lievano Karim from Colombia. Her dissertation title is Reclaiming Power in Violence Prevention Programming, a participatory action research movement for empowerment, agency, and well-being of young mothers in Colombia. Dr. Laura Lievano Karim is currently applying to tenure track positions in Colombia and other parts of the world. Congratulations. Hello, everyone. It is my pleasure to call to the stage Dr. Jin Chao Lai. The title of Dr. Lai's dissertation was Transcending the Model Minority Myth, a Comprehensive Analysis of Asian American Experiences in the California Child Welfare System. <laughs> After what is inevitably not going to be a long enough break, she is going to become a senior researcher at the Agile Visual Analytics Lab in the Luskin School of Public Affairs. Please welcome Dr. Lai. Uh, hello, I'm Aurora Jackson, and I'd like to welcome Jennifer Ray to the stage. <laughs> I'm going to say a little bit more about her, but her dissertation title is Adverse Childhood Experiences in Early Childhood and Behavior Problems in Middle Childhood and Adolescence Among Poor Black Children in Single Mother Families non-resident father involvement, mother's parenting stress, co-parenting, and perceptions of neighborhood social cohesion. What I want to say is that this is a three-paper dissertation. She has written three papers, and it has been my pleasure to work with her on those papers. And I'm going to give you the title of those papers because they're going to be published, because they're very, very, they're very, very good. They're very, very good. The first paper is titled Adverse Childhood Experiences in Early Childhood and Behavior Problems in Middle Childhood and Adolescence, the Roles of Father, a Non-Resident Father Involvement and Mother's Parenting Stress and Single uh, Parent uh, Black, in Single Parent Black Families, which is really the title of her dissertation. The, the second paper is Single Mother's Perceptions of Neighborhood Social Cohesion parenting stress, adverse childhood experiences in early childhood, and black children's behavior problems in middle childhood and adolescence. And the third paper is non-resident fathers' social support networks, co-parenting, adverse childhood experiences in early childhood, and child behavior problems over time among poor black youth. These papers were informed by a, theoretically by a person process context model and carried out using structural equation uh, modeling statistical techniques. It has been a pleasure to work with Jennifer and she will be applying for, uh, for uh, uh, positions in some of the universities across, I think, 
the state of California. <laughs> Good morning. I'm Mark Kaplan. Um, let me call to the stage Amelia Muller Williams. Um, Amelia's uh, dissertation is titled um, Prevalence and Socioeconomic Factors Associated with Self Injury Mortality colon, <laughs> Differences in Vulnerability Across Racial Groups. And I am delighted to announce that uh, on July 1st, Amelia will join the University of Michigan Addiction Center in the Department of Psychiatry as a National Institute of Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism T32 Research Fellow. Congratulations. Good morning, everyone. My name is Brian Kim, and I'm pleased to call Michelle Wong to the stage. Uh, her dissertation is a mouthful, so I'm going to read it. <laughs> so, uh, her dissertation is titled Gender Racial Microaggressions, Job Related Burnout, and Psychological Distress Among Asian American Women in the STEM Workplace, the World of Perceived Exploitation and Diversity Climate. Uh, this is an innovative and timely work that not only examines the overlooked experiences of oppression that Asian American women face in STEM workplace, but also looks at organizational factors like diversity climate. I'm really excited that she will continue this impactful work here, right at UCLA, actually, as a postdoctoral scholar. So please congratulate her again. Hello, everyone. I'm uh, Professor Laura Abrams, and I am pleased to introduce Dr. Michael Applegarth. <laughs> The title of Michael's dissertation is Stopping the Revolving Door, Understanding the Connection Between Mental Illness and Recidivism for Persons on Parole. Michael will be joining the faculty at the University of Buffalo School of Social Work as an assistant professor this summer and will continue his research on the intersection of mental health and the criminal legal system. Congratulations, Dr. Applegard. And last, but definitely not least, I'm thrilled to introduce Dr. Javier Garcia Perez. <laughs> the title of Javier's dissertation is Viviendo en la Intercesión, Queer, Femme, Latinx, Men, Trans, and Gender Variant Individuals Experience Living, not done, Living at the Intersection of Identities. Javier will be joining the University of Pennsylvania School of Social Policy and Practice as a postdoctoral scholar where he will continue to conduct research on the strengths and needs of the queer Latinx community. Congratulations, Dr. Garcia Perez. And now Chair Chris Tilley will present the urban planning doctoral candidates. It's my pleasure to call to the stage the PhD faculty advisors and their doctoral candidates from urban planning. I would like to call to the stage Dr. Chris Giamarino. <laughs> Chris's dissertation is titled Planning Just Public Space, Reimagining Hostile Designs Through Do-It-Yourself Urban Design Tactics by Unhoused Communities in Los Angeles. 
He employs spatial ethnography to study in depth different homeless landscapes in Los Angeles. This is an outstanding piece of research that manages to give voice to a hard to access vulnerable group. Chris is a scholar of public spaces, but he's particularly interested in the most vulnerable. He's entering the academic job market and with seven academic publications already under his belt in top tier journals, I have no doubt that he will soon land a great job. Any university will be lucky to have him. Congratulations, Chris. Hi, I'm Vineet Mukherjee, and, and I would like to invite Dr. Jessica Bremner here. Uh, it's, it's my privilege and pleasure to present Dr. Jessica Bremner. Her excellent dissertation, Thirsty by Design, Regulating Water Access in the Coachella Valley, examines racial and spatial justice, governance, and environmental services in Riverside County's Coachella Valley by focusing on unequal uh, access to water. Through spatial analysis, archival research, interviews, and case studies, Dr. Bremner shows how policy decisions prioritizing water infrastructure investments for retirement and recreational communities aggravate the poor water access of underserved residents, mainly migrant farm workers and Latinx residents. Their access, Jessica shows, is measurably worsens both in absolute terms, particularly in terms of arsenic measurements and in relative terms compared to their neighbors. Jessica has been working since January as an assistant professor at California State University, Los Angeles. Congratulations, Dr. Bremner. Good morning, I'm Evelyn Blumenberg, and I'd like to introduce and congratulate Julene Paul, who will join me. <clears throat> so, um, in contrast to what sometimes feels like a dog-eat-dog -dog world out there, uh, Julene's dissertation centers on an activity that I think most of us here today can get behind, and that activity is sharing. Uh, in urban planning, the sharing of resources is often held up as a pathway to a more sustainable and equitable future in cities, and yet we know relatively little about this behavior, this sharing behavior, particularly in the U.S. and particularly as it relates to private resources. Julene's dissertation, and its title is, and I'm also going to read it, Sharing In and Sharing Out, the Equity Implications of Informal Vehicle Sharing, fills this gap. Julene uh, has used mixed methods and a creative set of data sources to examine the sharing of private vehicles, private automobiles. Her analysis highlights the uh, prevalence of this behavior, the benefits of vehicle sharing, particularly for low-income travelers and then some of the challenges associated with informal vehicle share, uh, sharing. These challenges provide the basis for important policy interventions, hopefully, as, as Michael talked about, uh, the kind of the opening uh, to change, she's a transportation scholar, so the metaphor of changing the road, I think, uh, is a, a, a good one. There's no rest for the weary. This fall, Julene is going to uh, pack her bags and make a move to the Dallas area, where she will begin her appointment as an assistant professor at the University of Texas at Arlington. Please join me in congratulating Dr. and soon-to-be Professor Julene Paul. And now we will present the candidates for the Master of Urban and Regional Planning. And Professors Chris Tilley and Adam Miller Ball will present the candidates. And Dean Lucato Sedaris will confirm 
confer the degree. Will the candidates for the Master of Urban and Regional Plannings please rise? <laughs> Interim Dean Lukaitu Sedaris, I present to you the candidates for the Master of Urban and Regional Planning. On behalf of the faculty of the Department of Urban Planning, I certify that these candidates have fulfilled the rigorous requirements of the MURP degree. Thank you. By the power vested in me by the regents of the University of California, I confer upon you the degree of Master of Urban and Regional Planning and all rights and privileges thereof. Eliza Franklin Leggett. Yeah. Antonia Jordan Isogu. Monica Gonzalez. Angela May Mischke. Thomas Lunn, <laughs> Sophie Frank, <laughs> Elizabeth Greenfield, <laughs> Chen Lucy <Lucie> Wu, <laughs> Than Lam. Ernest Frederick Johnson. <laughs> Mandla Kaise. <laughs> Seth Reichert. <laughs> Nicole Madison. <laughs> Shona Patterson. Emily Biro, <laughs> Rachel Seberg, <laughs> Pearl Liu, <laughs> Jinglan Lin, <laughs> Crystal Yu. <laughs> Caitlin Lin. Victor Tran, <laughs> Lucia Rossignol, <laughs> Mary Alice Williams, <laughs> Connor Denty, <laughs> Brittany Liu, <laughs> Heather Kapsika. Bailey Lai, Jackson Zhang, Madeline French, Corinne Odom, Deja Elon McCauley. Dina Dominguez, <laughs> Edgar Reyna, <laughs> Leslie Retteria Salom, <laughs> Mariana Estrada, <laughs> Stephanie Garcia, <laughs> Leslie Olympia Velasquez. Diana Alcolse, <laughs> Tiffany Rivera, 
Lupe Deles. Jin Zhang. Kevin Liu. Michael Rosen. Elena Savignano. Ali Padgett. Joshua Brett. Emily Rubalcada. Graham Rossmore. John David Amley. Sarah Dugali. George Kerem. Miguel Miguel. Christina Ibarra. Christine Victoria Bustillos. Andrew Morley Boland. Casey Truong. Carl Kevin Pascasio. <laughs> Christopher Hung Do. Isabel Gavan. <laughs> Vanessa Reyes Salata. <laughs> Bryce Kennedy. <laughs> Kyla Foreman. <laughs> Lindsay Morris. <laughs> Zoe Thruman. Gri Huston Cowan. <laughs> Iris Craig. <laughs> <laughs> Elliot Sung Shaw. Oma <laughs> <Omer> Sohail. <laughs> Brittany Montano. <laughs> Natasha Timmons. <laughs> Michael O'Brien. Olivia Urena. <laughs> Amanda Gomsen. <laughs> Katrina Deloso. <laughs> Audrey Yunsuk Yang. <laughs> Lillian Liang. <laughs> Joan Parks. Abigail Kusholek. <laughs> Stephanie Calvillo. <laughs> Hayat Russell. <laughs> Jocelyn Baroe Baltazar. <laughs> Emma Ramirez. <laughs> Nick Stewart Block. <laughs> Maggie C. <laughs> Anne Yoon. <laughs> and Shweta Sunda. <laughs> Are you lost? Oh, no. hmm. <laughs> Emmanuel and Prusa Logu. <laughs> Amanda Caswell. And we will now present the candidates for the Master of Public Policy. 
and Professors Mark Peterson, Zev Yaroslavsky, and Zachary Steiner Threlkeld will present the candidates. And Interim Dean Lucato Sideris will confer the degree. Will the candidates for the Master of Public Policy please rise? Interim Dean Luketu Sideris, it is my honor and privilege to present to you the candidates for the Master of Public Policy. On behalf of the faculty of the Department of Public Policy, I certify that these candidates have fulfilled the rigorous requirements for the MPP degree. Thank you, Mark. By the power vested in me by the Regents of the University of California, I confer upon you the degree of Master of Public Policy and all rights and privileges thereof. Chinyere Jasmine Luanye. Jean, Jean Mar Alicia. Yen. Julia Hernandez Nierenberg. Gabriela Imai. Darielle Jewel Diana Green. Selena Destiny Melgoza. Savannah Ayar Dudar. <laughs> Stephanie Tapia Onate. <laughs> Raquel Clarice Jackson Stone. Diego Alejandro Bravo. Sky Blue Allen. Evelyn Paula Estrada. Denise Gutierrez. Jose Garcia. Oops, sorry. David Jose Ventura Zelaya. Mary Ming Zhao Nguyen. Dinan Guan. Dinan Guan. Jaime Cervantes de Reinstein. Maya Gutierrez. Lana Victoria Zimmerman. Lauren Elizabeth Dunlap. Sonia Zamora. Lindsay Irene Kane. Sydney Silvestre. Ibuki Yamada. Naoki Hayashida. Yeah. Maya Ofek. Nicholas Perloff Giles. Jesse Ostroff. Alan Brandon Rivera. Rocio Perez.
Jillian Shaw Weaver. Bahar Ahmadzadeh. Yuming Ji. Megumi Araba. Mutuki Sakai. Elizabeth Placentia. Fanjing Kong. Annie Gu. Ziyi Ming. Jachen Shang. Chen Wong. Li Han Wang. Jinji Carol Ju. Dr. Alma Rosa Lopez. Celine Betancourt. Jamie Park. Mara O'Neill. Emily Platt Silberstein. Abilasha Benola. Connie Kwong. Molly Kathleen Hunt. Aisha Abdallah Lopez. Melanie Cuevas. Guadalupe Gutierrez. Aditi Peyush. Leticia Bustamante Ortiz. Nancy Olivares. Monica Mata. Sochi Ramon Lopez. Diana Luciero Escamilla Galvan. Imelda Islas. Yaritza Alejandra Gonzalez. Alejandra Garcia Gutierrez. Tyler Christopher Webb. Yeah. Elliot Woods. Yeah. Jeffrey Soria. Yeah. Kamalpreet Singh Chima. Yeah. Christian Lua. Alberto Martin Murillo. Thomas Hernandez. Dimitri English. Dan Earhart. Sebastian Perez. Eric Tyrone Henderson.
Ty Alexander Pearson. Ethan W. Ellis. Riman Hussein. Nanja Quadros. Angelica Estrada. Eli Holland. Alex Jose Moisa. Fernando Ochoa. Abraham Chung. Matsumichi Ichikura. May Naito. Karen Chang. Iris Lee. Hong Chen. Adam Garcia. Austin Tyler Mendoza. Hana Abdelati. Carlos Alarson. <laughs> Nazira Bolatkizi. <laughs> and Mitra Biglari. And, and we will now present the candidates for the Master of Social Work, Social Welfare, Social Welfare, Professor, Professor Laura Abrams and Janae Moyo will present the candidates and Interim Dean Lucato Sedaris will award, confer the degree. Okay, will the candidates for the Master of Social Welfare please rise. <laughs> Interim Dean, Luketu Sedaris, I present to you the candidates for the Master of Social Welfare. On behalf of the faculty of the Department of Social Welfare, I certify that these candidates have fulfilled the rigorous requirements of the MSW degree. Thank you, Laura. By the power vested in me by the regents of the University of California, I confer upon you the degree of Master of Social Welfare and all rights and privileges thereof. <laughs> Valina Lee Mitchell. Emmy Page. <laughs> Danielle Keita Naguchi. <laughs> Sasha Fernandez. <laughs> Isabel Coco Clements. Samantha Reese Feldman. Oh, 
Van Hai Tran. Angela Emer Medrano. Gabriella Rose Collins. T. Martin. Julia Elizabeth Jagels. Ray Jones. Fiona Farrell. Claire Amabile. Justine Marie Quiros Martinez. Jaime Cervantes de Reinstein. Mary Minyao Nguyen. Aisha Abdallah. Alicia Michelina Smith. Nancy Jennifer Rivas. Dana Lizette Herrera. Brianna Lizette Laza. Clarissa Victoria Sanchez. Zoe Renee Valray. Cameron Renee Reyes. Joanne Leslie Plummer. Julia Hernandez Nirenberg. Avery Elizabeth Takuka. Kira Simone Ray Armstrong. Sara Bagia. Rahma Junadian. <laughs> Lauren Janelle Lewis. <laughs> Morgan Keller. <laughs> Petra Lang. Rebecca Elizabeth Corp. Yeah. Ella Jane Canavaccio Locavlan. Yeah. Clarissa Esperanza Mancia. Yeah. Kayun Yu. Grace Cho. Woo! 
Sophia Marie Plotkin. Alyssa Marie Mazuko. Brianna Lynn Saavedra. Keenan Leary. Jefferson Seymour Hall IV. China Tucker. Patricia Katsarzina Safran. Joanna Fernandez. Mirella Gonzalez. Samantha Reyes McCann. Miranda Ray Velasquez. Daisy Lucas. Stephanie Suarez. Candace Kailani Vergara de Vera. Jessica Valdez. Jessica Valdez. Jesus Adan. Nicolas Valles. Nicole Leanne Mendigochia. Mayra Alejandra Delgado Garcia. <laughs> Ivan Bass. <laughs> Anselmo Jesus Montes. Angelina Vong. <laughs> Samantha Kiame Koyama. <laughs> Neda Noah Sinankar. Shailene Shah. Yeah. Eileen She. Yeah. Janessa McKenna Chase. Yeah. Megan Nicole Smith Bocanegra. Karen Melisa Gomez. Atziri Rodriguez. Sofia Kealoha Paturakas. You cheat, you. Oh. 
Sarah Ar Arlene Kwan. Julia Kosi Leon. Miguel Salgado. Micah Chase. Sam, Sam Fuller. Mahmouda Jorna Islam. Rosa Maria Lagunas. Alejandro Vicente Chavez Suchlit. Catherine Tien Tran Nguyen. Brittany Alexandra Maxwell. Mario Rivera. <laughs> Molly Rose Rothside. John Cabans. Maggie Pena. Juliana Rose Mora. <laughs> Stephen Heminiano. <laughs> Ashley Yen. You look <laughs> Kento Sakamoto. ceremony is drawing to a close. Uh, it is a time for a few thank yous. I want to give a special thanks to the university organist, Professor Christoph Bull. I would like to extend my great gratitude to my colleagues, all the faculty here, And all the staff that are invisible, but believe me, they worked extremely hard to make this wonderful celebration happen. A big thank you to Michael Tabs, our wonderful commencement speaker. And now we salute are graduates of the UCLA Laskin School of Public Affairs. <laughs> I 
As we prepare to leave, I would like to ask the families and friends to please remain seated until the class of 2023 recesses from Royce Hall. Please enjoy. We have a reception and food outside at the Dixon Plaza. Congratulations, UCLA, Laskin class of 2023. We love you.